And the S&P 500 is set to close above 5,000 for the first time ever with the gains driven by big tech. But the question now, is it time to take a breather or is there more room to run? And we've got your investor playbook with Shana Sissel, Banrian Capital Management CEO and Jeremy Bryan, Gradient Investments Senior Portfolio Manager. Welcome both of you to the show. Jeremy, I'll start with you. Listen, we could be making history here. It looks like the SPX, the S&P 500 about to close above 5,000. Jeremy, I'm just curious, you look at this run, you think that rally continues or no? Do you think maybe there's some signs of caution here, at least in near to intermediate term? Yeah, you know, I look at 5,000 as more of just a milestone, right? It doesn't really tell us what future direction holds at all. So from our perspective, you know, we're, we're still looking at the business fundamentals. And for the most part, there's still relatively strong signals out there that we could continue this. First, that, you know, just generally markets, when they hit all time highs, there's more of a higher likelihood of going higher than lower. So you have history so, somewhat on your side. We just cleared an earnings season for the most part that was, you know, had some mixed bags, but I think overall generally didn't change the trajectory negatively. It probably was equal to maybe even slightly positive. And the jobs numbers continue to be very resilient. That's been the biggest part from our side is understanding that a consumer that has money and has job or can get a job if they need one is going to continue to spend money. That's what drives our economy. That's why we may maintain relatively positive on the market overall. And Shana, what about you here? The momentum that we have seen that has carried us sort of uh, past this 5,000 level and keeps hitting new records, what would be sort of the most likely contender to stop it if it was going to stop? Well, I don't really see a lot of headwinds for what's going on. We have very strong economic growth, very strong uh, employment. Uh, but if there was anything, it would be the Fed. Um, I think that most likely the, uh, the thing that could put the brakes on what we're seeing is the Fed not, uh, not cutting rates the way the market thinks. Um, they've been very clear that they do intend to cut rates this year. They're not really sure how many times the market expected six. The Fed put uh, a kibosh on that. Um, I think if anything is going to be uh, the thing that puts the brakes on what we're seeing, it's going to be Fed action. And Jeremy, I'll come back to you. you know, give, give, come back to just some investment ideas for, for our viewers. Jeremy, I know one sector you like is healthcare. How come, Jeremy, and, and where exactly do you see opportunity there? Yeah, uh, relatively discounted valuations and still pretty good top line in, in earnings growth. I mean, there's certain areas, healthcare really didn't work that well last year. I mean, if you look overall, comparatively, it was an underperformer. Obviously, most was underperforming against tech. But even in that case, there were a couple of standout performers via the GLP-1 drugs, but everything else was kind of middle of the road. Again, they became cheaper as a result of that because their earnings estimates didn't come down a heck of a lot. So that's where we think that there's just opportunity, whether that's in insurance and devices. Those are the kinds of areas we're concentrating most on. We just think they're opportunistic and the valuations aren't aggressive for the opportunities they have. And Jeremy, though, would, would you stick with the GLP-1 producers, Novo, Lilly? Uh, no, uh, that's their short answer here. So the quick answer of that is, we still think it's a phenomenal opportunity, right? Don't get me wrong. There's still going to be an addressable market that's massively. But the valuations that have come as a result of that, it's a very different story than NVIDIA, right? Is that that's another massive story. But if you look at the earnings growth there, that company's valuation's actually been about the same to even slightly cheaper. That is not the case for Novo and Lilly, who have had dramatic changes in their valuation profile. That's just going to make them, if you have a three and five year time horizon, especially as competitors come into the play, Play, it's just going to be a little harder for them to kind of continue to accelerate at that pace unless we believe this opportunity is significantly bigger than even numbers are anticipating right now. And we're just not there. So we chose to eliminate. We've had those positions in the past. We don't have them any longer. And Shada, let's kind of get your investor playbook here as we look at these highs in the market. I find it interesting as we talk about healthcare and looking beyond the GLP ones that Novartis is on your list. Um, of picks as well. Um, are you sort of thinking similarly to Jeremy here when it comes to healthcare and sort of non GLP one healthcare? Very much so. Veritex Pharmaceuticals and Novartis are the two healthcare names on our playbook uh, list. 
Um, both of them have really, really strong franchises in certain areas of the market, which I think have growth opportunity. With Veritex, it's the stick fibrosis um, uh, work that they have. They, they basically own that market, and they're growing out other areas. In the case of Novartis, they have some real game-changing oncology drugs uh, like Kiskali, who, uh, which has changed the game when it comes to breast cancer. These are drugs that have great growth potential. These particular uh, firms have great franchises and a great mode around those franchises that really put them in control. Uh, so I'm looking away from the Eli Lilly's and really focusing on these other places, which could be the next big uh, drug uh, deals that we start to see coming through that really are changing the game, broadly speaking, as well. And those are the two that I really think have that. And Jeremy, I also want to get your take on the Magnificent Seven. Of course, listen, a lot of viewers listening right now, they're, they're in those names, Jeremy. They've had strong runs. Do you see, you know, big potential upside relative to expectations for any of those names? Yeah, we still own six of the seven. Um, the one that we don't, we haven't owned, we've never owned Tesla. Um, just frankly, it's a little, we, we don't quite understand the story quite as well. Um, but from our point of view and our perspective, you know, uh, Amazon and Google still seem to be the best relative long-term opportunity. But what we've been doing across this board is as these continue to accelerate, and especially when they have these dramatic runs, is we've just been taking some off the table without selling them entirely. And I think that's absolutely prudent and justifiable to do is that you don't have to sell the position out entirely, but probably bring that back because the concentration in your own portfolios has probably gotten pretty high if you've owned these throughout this entire time. So taking those profits and taking some of that off the table and still owning them if they continue to rally, but using some of those profits to buy other things that haven't participated quite to the certain extent right. is absolutely prudent and that's what we've been doing here. And Shana, I know you own NVIDIA too, but we gotta leave it there because we're coming up on the closing bell. So we'll have you both back soon. Shana and Jeremy, thank you so much.